first and foremost, what are we talking about? What are IFRS S1 and S2? So IFRS S1 provides a framework for disclosing sustainability related information that's material to a company's performance. And so I, S1 uh, sets out a framework for companies to specifically use SASB. So SASB was a previously independent standard that's now been absorbed into ISSB. Um, but SASB sets out, uh, they have an industry classification system where they classify 77 different industries um, that you might fall under and associated sustainability metrics that a company in that industry should be reporting on to give a complete picture of their operations. And so some companies will neatly fall into a specific industry. Some companies with vast wide operations might fall into several different industries. That's completely fine. You can report on more than one SASB standard for this S1 general sustainability disclosure. So when, we're, when we talk about sustainability, um, this really runs the gambit of environmental, social, and, and governance data. On the other hand, IFRS S2 specifically focuses only on climate related uh, risks and opportunities. And so um, you're required to disclose things such as climate related risks um, related to physical transition related to climate change, uh, transitional risks. Um, you're also required to disclose any net zero targets and you're also your scope one, two and three greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but more on scope three greenhouse gas emissions shortly. Um, ultimately, S1 and S2 serve as the baseline for most regulatory adoption of sustainability disclosures worldwide. Um, in fact, um, you'll notice here on this map that 20 plus jurisdictions worldwide have already or are in the process of adopting ISSB standards. And so you'll also notice from these statistics that these 20 plus jurisdictions are definitely not negligible on the, on the global stage. Um, some some countries include Canada, uh, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, China, Japan, uh, Singapore, Brazil, the list really goes on. Um, and so as these standards are progressively adopted across the world, they'll really grow to have a, a great influence on global financial markets, especially just in terms of harmonizing sustainability reporting across borders, because global investors will then have access to much more comparable and consistent ESG data therefore facilitating cross-border investment decisions, um, comparing apples to apples as opposed to apples to oranges. And so while the standards are global, uh, it's important to know also that there may be regional variations in how the standards themselves are actually implemented, uh, depending on the local regulatory environment or market practices. Uh, most jurisdictions will undergo a consultation period within their country to adapt the ISSB standards for a more local context. Uh, we'll get into some more details on the Canadian context shortly, but it's, it's important to understand that, that the meat of the ISSB standards stays consistent. It's really the implementation that changes, but the ultimate goal, again, is to ensure consistency um, across jurisdictions, across industries. And so, as I've started to hint at, why are we talking about ISSB today? Well, as you saw on the last slide, sustainability is no longer just a voluntary fringe movement. Um, financial regulators across the world, now supported by IFRS's standardization uh, initiative, they're now able to mainstream the integration of sustainability reporting in global markets. So the same way that standardized accounting practices arose several decades ago and set a new baseline for corporate reporting, this is the next step in that evolution of providing financially material um, information to investors. And so what do I need to do tomorrow? We'll get into the timeline shortly, um, but ISSB adoption, while it might have seemed like a very far away thing when they were first introduced, they're here and they're ready to be reported on. We're actually currently in the first reporting cycle for ISSB, uh, but as we'll cover in the, as Shaz will cover in the risks section, um, there's a lot of legwork involved in setting up internal reporting, uh, setting up return, setting up internal reporting capacity. Um, so early adoption and early assessments are really crucial for setting up that internal capacity in the face of upcoming regulations. And lastly, what do you gain from early adoption? And in addition to capacity building, which is definitely important, um, assessing ESG within your operations also highlights 
key risks and opportunities that you might not otherwise be privy to uh, without collecting that data. And so furthermore, um, like adopting voluntarily ISSB early um, also provides, of course, regulatory alignment that's upcoming, but also competitive uh, advantage in terms of communicating to civil society, investors, peers, that the organization prioritizes sustainability and risk awareness. Um, and so next slide, please, Shaz. And so in terms of who will be impacted by these upcoming regulations, well, first and foremost, as we've been discussing, investors will have access to much more consistent and comparable data and uh, related to sustainability, therefore allowing them to inform their due diligence and inform their investing. On the other hand, reporting entities, which can really be any size of com com company or corporation, it's very likely that they will need to update their own internal processes, their own data collection methods, their own governance and oversight structures to comply with these new standards. So previously, finance teams are collecting uh, data for financial reports. However, adding in that sustainability layer into these financial reports can't only fall on the finance team because this data is being greenhouse gas emission data and um, like employee diversity data, et cetera, that information isn't currently being held in solely the finance department. This is a very, um, the information is found throughout. Um, and so adapting those, those departments with the right resources. And lastly, for assurers, it's important for assurers to develop robust sustainability accounting proficiency to be able to keep up and ensure uh, consistency across of different types of ESG data. Uh, carbon accounting, for instance, is quite an intensive practice um, that, that is growing in, in, in popularity. And so these groups aren't, um, sorry, if you could go back, Shaz, so these groups aren't mutually exclusive. Uh, if we take the example of a private equity firm, so a private equity firm would both fall into the bucket of investors and reporting entities. So they as investors get access to more more detailed ESG data, which can inform their due diligence and their investment practices, which is great. But on the other hand, they also have to internally adapt their own reporting processes, both for their institutional investors and for regulators. They have to adapt their reporting processes to not only reflect sustainability considerations at the parent level, but also at the portfolio level. So where, where whatever company they're investing into, that is also reflective of their overall sustainability performance. And so now moving along into the timeline, we've heard about the who, the what, the who, the when. Now looking at looking at the, the timeline itself, up top you'll see the yellow dots, that's ISSB. We're comparing it with the green dots below that are the Canadian uh, equivalent, so CSSB. Looking at ISSB first, um, so ISSB's IFRS S1 and S2 were first released in June of last year um, with implementation to start this past January. So like I was mentioning, we are in the first reporting cycle. Um, and so what ISSB has done, they've provided reliefs in order to make the adoption process more palatable to companies. So of course, this, as I've been mentioning, this is a lot of data, a lot of data that companies aren't currently collecting. So it's a big lift. And so they've eased that process by breaking it up into more uh, palatable chunks. So the very first reporting cycle, uh, companies only have to report on climate-related um, disclosures. So only S2 for this, for this first reporting cycle. As of next year, um, they would also have to include the general sustainability. Um, I had mentioned earlier that I was going to touch on the scope three greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in, a, in order to also lighten the load, the very first reporting cycle also excludes scope three emissions because especially companies that have very large value chains um, with multiple different supply chain providers, um, scope three greenhouse gas emissions gets quite intensive. And so that's excluded from the first year and included in, as of the second reporting cycle. So as of the second reporting cycle, S1 and S2 are completely required. Whereas in Canada, Canada has undergone different comment periods um, the last which was closed back in this past June, so just a, just two months ago. Um, and so we're currently awaiting the finalized CSDS um, reg, um, like draft. Um, however, it's anticipated that the the difference between ISSB and CD, CSDS will be 
it's only a year difference in the very first reporting cycle. So as opposed to um, starting in January 2025, 2024, they would start in 2025 with solely the climate related disclosures. And an, uh, another added relief solely for Canadians um, is that instead of having to report on general sustainability and scope three as of the very next year, uh, there's a two year delay to allow for companies to really adjust to that um, those requirements that will be needed for them. So it's really as of January 2027 that that that's required. And so um, again, the the meat of the content is quite the same as ISSB. It's purely in the in the reliefs, um, the delays currently that um, the differences lie. Um, Shaz, if you could go to the next. And so. Lastly, um, before our quick Q&A, so if you have any questions, you can start thinking about them and typing them up. Um, so the implementation process, what, what does it look like for an entity that's trying to uh, comply with this ISSB um, regulation, so, or the standard? So step one is to identify relevant industries in your value chain. Again, I had mentioned one company might fall neatly into one, one industry, but they might fall into several. So it's about doing that mapping to see where your revenue streams lie and what uh, what industries um, are then relevant for you to disclose on. So then step two is to go into the SASB industry standards and to select out the applicable standards, um, which then, so again, the, sta the SASB standards list out specific metrics that are relevant to that industry. For example, um, if you're a restaurant, it'll um, ask you about the percentage of restaurants that have been inspected by a food safety oversight body, for instance. And so you report on those metrics. Then ISSB also requires you to consider additional metrics from other standards, including GRI, uh, CDSB. Um, and so they list out other material topics that you're required to consider, see if they're material to your operations. If they are out of these almost 100 different metrics, you select them and add them into your reporting. So steps one, two, and three are essentially setting up your own internal reporting framework, selecting out the metrics that are applicable to your, um, to your business model. As of step four, then you start providing data for those KPIs. So provide data for the metrics. Once you've provided that data, that sustainability data, your S1 would be complete. Um, then you would also then turn to climate specific data you would collect, again, scope one, two, and three greenhouse gas emissions, any net zero targets, provide that, that color and context on specifically climate disclosures. And at that point, if you're a smaller entity with no subsidiaries, no investments, your um, ISSB, IFRS, S1, and S2 report would be done. If you are a bigger corporation with subsidiaries, with portfolio investments, then you would have to repeat the same exercise, so steps one to five, with any subsidiaries. and then assess from their individual reports what trick what information trickles upward to be materially relevant for the parent company as well and so the materiality assessment um, is one of the more challenging parts of assessing what what is relevant if it's relevant for the subsidiary but is it relevant for the parent company ultimately once that uh, exercise is done and those uh, subsidiary level information is or that information is uh, incorporated into the parent level uh, report at that point that you would have a completed IFRS S1 and S2 disclosure. So that was a lot of information, but if there's any questions at this time, uh, feel free to ask away in the Q&A feature. Um, if we'd ask that you keep maybe your longer questions uh, for the end, we'll have a, a lot more time provided for that, but any, any quick clarifying questions, happy to, to answer. Uh, before we get into the second half. Seeing none, um, feel free to keep thinking away um, and Shaz, uh, feel free to take it away as well. Thank you so much. So we've covered in this webinar uh, so far, but thank you so much to Sophie for that. Uh, the implementation timeline, what are the exact implementation processes, and then what are the benefits of early adoption? Having covered all of that, it is important for there to be 
a good exploration of all of the risks associated when we look at ISSB disclosures. So the first thing that we look at when risks are aligned, whenever any new standard comes about, is basically the operational risks. So we've identified two risks that we find many organizations going through whenever any new sustainability framework comes in. So the first one is integrating new requirements into existing systems. Now, this one's quite interesting because this is the first time where a standard is actually combining financial disclosures with sustainability disclosures, because previously you could have finance working separately and sustainability teams working separately. Your financial disclosures at the end of the year as finance teams put out and as this webinar is being supported by CPA Ontario uh, sponsored uh, CSPM. So we will have quite a few uh, attendees from the accounting and assurance sector. What we find is that when new standards are being introduced and you have a lot of new frameworks coming in, and this is data that is not all financial information, then this can create a lot of backlog and it requires a lot of support just to ensure that the existing systems are able to handle the need for the information coming in. Similarly, there are concerns of internal capacity because as mentioned before, we do have finance teams that are very good at processing financial information, but now that these disclosures also have sustainability information and these sustainability data points are going to come from all ends of the organization, that requires a lot of internal capacity development and achieving high data coverage. So for example, if there is a particular data point that has come up as a material topic for disclosures, that will, may not have been something that was even being collected on at the organizational level. So with these risks involved, we wanted to recommend a few possible mitigation strategies. So the first one is the actual evaluation of the reporting requirements. So for example, as Sophie mentioned, there is a materiality assessment. So for a smaller organization, it would just encompass the organization. However, if you have a portfolio approach, then you have a lot more entities to be able to apply that on. So knowing what the reporting requirements are based on the materiality for your organization is very important. Once that is done, then we look at the identification of the relevant data gaps. As I mentioned, because this is a completely new territory for many organizations, knowing what are the gaps in the data, where data may not be coming in because it just was never collected, or data may not be coming in because there are uh, relationships with different departments or different entities where that data is going to come from, it is all going to be covered in a data gap identification exercise. Once that is done, then the most important part to ensure that an organization is set up for ISSB disclosures is the correct assigning of responsibilities. Just like an organization's uh, overview can be found through their org chart, there has to be a sustainability related org chart in the organization as well. So for example, what is the relationship of the finance team with the sustainability team, the procurement team, operations team, all of that has to come together and someone uh, ideally at the C-suite level has to have the overall responsibility and then specific responsibilities regarding data gathering, data processing, data validation, and then making sure that everything comes together needs to be done. So these are a few key operational risks. When we move on to the next ones, we've actually identified a few ancillary operational risks that are very important to also consider. So the first one is accessing cross-departmental information. Because as we've covered, now that ISSB disclosures actually involve non-financial information as well as financial information, it is going to be very important for all of the departments to come together and create a cohesive strategy for how this information is going to be accessed and be made ready for the final disclosures. Similarly, what we also find is that the ISSB has introduced a set of quantitative indicators that obviously will be defined based on the materiality assessment, but just the indicators themselves actually require four or five different quantitative output, outputs. So for example, if I'm calculating just one indicator, the data might actually be needed 
from three or four different teams, multiple departments, all of that comes together. There are equations available, and then that data needs to be plugged in. The final output needs to then be available, and that can create a lot of friction between not just getting the data, but ensuring that the right equations and the calculations are being applied. So these are some additional operational risks as organizations gear up for ISSB disclosures. And we have a few mitigation strategies to propose here as well. So the first one is internal competencies development. What we find is that now that new standards are coming in and sustainability information and financial information are going to go hand in hand, it is very important for even new roles to be created, new job descriptions to come in, and then existing resources and stakeholders to be trained on what more needs to be done. This competencies development is going to be a direct result of the data gap identification and the evaluation of the materiality assessments that we covered in the previous slide. In addition to this, we also can definitely take stock of the external expertise available from third parties. There are multiple advisory options available, consulting options available that can actually supplement where the organization needs a little bit of time to create internal capacity as well. Or this function could necessarily also be outsourced in a way where internally the data can be made available, but then as and when needed for the data gathering, data validation, or just processing, uh, all of these third parties can actually be relied upon. What we also wanted to do as part of the webinar is to cover risks that are specifically associated with financial institutions as they look at ISSB disclosures. And one of the things that we've seen that comes up as a recurring issue for financial institutions is the aspect of portfolio management. So a financial institution like a bank may have a lending portfolio or a private equity firm will have a, a, a portfolio of companies where they would have invested and the operational risks associated, the main one from our perspective that needs to be looked at in addition to the operational roles we've already covered is the materiality assessment and data coverage across the portfolio. So let's zoom out a bit, for example. If we have an example of an organization that has a portfolio of investee companies, so companies they have invested in, now as part of the organization's ISSB disclosures, there has to be information regarding the portfolio companies also uh, get included. And that creates an additional layer of complexity where data has to be collected from separate underlying entities and that data has to then be aggregated. That data also has to be validated if this is accurate, whether there was human error, whether this data is actually complete and actually covers the entire operation, what was the date of the addition of this data. So all of these challenges can come up. So we have a few mitigation strategies that financial institutions can start applying early to stay ahead of the curve on this. So the first one is creating sustainability champions across portfolio entities. So for example, for a private equity firm that has a portfolio of investee companies, the best way to do this uh, would be to assign responsibility to one person uh, inside the organization, and they can be the internal champion for sustainability in the organization, where it is their goal or their role to coordinate all of the activities reg regarding the information requests that are coming in from the main investing organization. Uh, it would be their job to be able to align responsibilities internally for different teams so where this data needs to come together. And also part of their role to actually talk about and communicate the importance of these initiatives within the organization. In the absence of that, all of the sustainability work could actually by dil be diluted amongst multiple different departments uh, without getting clarity on how the data coverage gaps and the data validation gaps are going to be solved for. Once this is done, the next mitigation strategy is the support to the portfolio entities on materiality assessments. What we find is that a materiality assessment is a very involved exercise and a lot of times might also include third party support. So for example, if advisory or consulting options are being relied upon to do this, and that can also increase costs. So when a large or investing organization is supporting that process, 
that is actually a value creation opportunity for the underlying investee companies as well. And it also gives a very good opportunity to the organization to actually get the data directly from the portfolio companies because they're actually seeing value come from the materiality assessments as well. So this is how we can actually look at mitigation strategies specifically in the context of ISSB disclosures. What we've found and a lot of uh, uh, people have requested us to also share how we look at automating the ISSB disclosures and reporting and uh, mitigation strategies specifically that we've discussed here. I'm just going to provide a quick two minute overview of how we solve this at ESG tree. So I'm going to shift my screen into how just a quick overview into ESG trees work on this process. So I will just get a confirmation, Sophie, from you, if you can see my screen. One moment. Please let me know. I can see it. Great. So the way uh, we do the automation for ISSB is that any firm can come in for our ISSB module and then they can just simply add their portfolio entities or even subsidiaries. And once they're added, then the system can actually very simply take you through your own materiality assessment. So on areas related to biodiversity, diversity, equity, inclusion, water and effluence, everything is available. So rather than having to go through advisory uh, options and uh, being able to choose uh, a, a lot of things, you have a, a checkbox exercise just so that you can assign where biodiversity, uh, where all of these material factors land as far as your value chain is concerned. And then the system would automatically provide uh, a pre-filled survey based on the materiality assessment. Once that is done and all of the data has come in and the platform also provides support on calculating carbon emissions, the system would actually start providing insights based on the company's responses, quantitative indicators, and then our users can actually choose which insights they actually want included in their report which can then be directly created within the system. So all of the data would be available, which can be downloaded. So essentially from end to end, it's a complete process for the platform to be a data hub for everything related to ISSB. So this was a fairly quick overview of ISSB in general, the implementation timelines, the process for uh, applying the disclosures as well. We're really grateful for the support of uh, CSPM here, uh, 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 supported by CP Ontario. And it would be great if we could uh, take questions from the audience at this point. Please feel free to add them in the chat. We have a very good question here, so I'll read it out. How can financial institutions integrate ISSB aligned sustainability data with existing financial reporting systems without duplicating efforts? So as Sophie mentioned, and Sophie, if it's possible for us to go to the implementation process slide. So essentially what needs to happen is the evaluation of the reporting requirements from ISSB which would create your own set of KPIs. So for example, let's say that the materiality assessment has been done for the entire organization and any underlying portfolio entities that results in your own KPIs that you would have. And then those KPIs need to be mapped against the other standards that your organization is already reporting on. So if we take an example of ISSB uh, compared to the ESG data convergence initiative, so we would automatically see that maybe the carbon emission related factors are actually going uh, to be completely mapped. So for that process, you don't need to be submitting information twice. It should just be one field. So scope one emissions, scope two emissions, scope three emissions, which can then be used for reporting for any number of frameworks that your organization would be aligned with. I hope that answers if there is a particular a uh, case that you might like to discuss uh, for your financial institution, please feel free to reach out. So I'm going to read out the questions here. So 
The next one is how can reporting on the S pillar in ESG be reported with the end goal of enhancing comparability, especially given that this is qualitative data. So on the S pillar, we also do get quite a bit of quantitative data. So for example, diversity metrics, so diversity at the board level, at the C-suite level, and then there are multiple other benchmarks available with it too. However, where there is specific qualitative information, we always recommend to be able to try the quantification route, even if it's a yes and no, so that it can work out with scoring. We've had quite a bit of experience with that. And the last thing that we would mention is that for the ISSB specifically, there is a lot of focus on quantitative disclosures and data gathering. So if you do go through a materiality assessment, you will see that the S part is largely quantitative. And the next question is, what approach would ESG tree adopt in those cases where we have a large company that needs to report a number of metrics, but many of those metrics need to be generated from small suppliers, say family run farms, which are far from using cutting edge technology. So that's a very interesting question. We worked quite a bit uh, with credit unions as well, and they have a lot of uh, SME uh, partners that they would say where data needs to come in. What we find is that Technology in and of itself is not the only uh, thing that's going to solve the solution. There's always there always has to be a human in the loop engagement because this data has to come from other people. Um, yes, in large organizations, there are multiple technology systems available, but we always recommend that for engagements like this, it is very important to have a team that is completely responsible for communicating the importance of these metrics to your stakeholders. And then that team should actually have the bandwidth to provide the handholding support that is needed. So in previous engagements that ESG tree has had, our team would actually, uh, would actually be available to do onboarding sessions. We can even do uh, follow-ups on phone calls. Sometimes it always helps to have a group onboarding session. And then if someone has questions, they can reach out uh, through multiple uh, communication channels that we have open. In another case, uh, the platform itself can actually provide a lot of the guidance or the inputs so that if they have any uh, question that is part of our frequently asked questions, that's already covered. But if there is any specific case that you might have, we'd be happy to hear from you. If there is a new question. Yes, so the next question is, what strategies can be implemented to address silos within organizations and facilitate cross-departmental collaboration and data sharing. Um, Sophie, would you like to take this one? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's it's definitely challenging. Um, there, there's definitely communication needs to, it starts from the top. So again, we, like Shaz had gone through in his mitigation strategies, assigning responsibility is, a big one here, especially because it'll trickle down from the top, assigning um, yeah, responsibilities for one, and also the sustainability org chart specifically, um, highlighting how how different department departments need to communicate with one another and what information is required from uh, each. Also, from more of like a data manipulation um, angle, there's also um, setting up data repositories where um, a centralized location where all data can be uh, put together as opposed to like chasing different different departments. Uh, Shaz, feel free to, to fill in if I've missed any. Uh, Sophie, spot on. We would com uh, completely agree with that. And another thing that I would add is that we always find that refreshers are very important. So even having sessions on the importance of sustainability, these disclosures, how it can actually provide more value to the company and create uh, value creation opportunities is quite important. So a lot of the work that we do with financial institutions, in addition to the technology platform that we provide, Sophie and her team would actually do refresher sessions for our clients where a lot of the information may have been covered in the previous year, but then there is staff turnover. Um, people may also need reminders. So once the sustainability 
the importance of sustainability and how the organization is now committed on that path is actually made clear and happens on an annual basis, there is going to be more engagement from the different teams where the data is coming from and especially facilitate cross-departmental collaboration. And we have another question. How does IFRS 2 prioritize climate-related disclosures compared to other international standards? Are there major differences compared to other reporting standards? So I'm going to assume that this is IFRS S2 rather than IFRS 2. So Sophie, you can take a first crack at this one. Yeah, absolutely. So IFRS S2 builds upon TCFD, so the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures. That's the the most similar. However, um, the the regular or the the ISSB builds upon the TCFD requirements. So it's not a direct copy paste from TCFD. There are some additional or like additional context that needs to be provided. Um, but in terms of how they prioritize uh, climate related disclosures, the there's the prioritization in terms of the, the climate related disclosures are required first uh, because that's really uh, the most pressing uh, issue that needs to be addressed. Um, but ultimately, um, they are equal to that to the S1 that's just required a little bit later. Thanks, Sophie. We have another question. Uh, this is a very interesting way of getting information, but many companies, especially the small ones, are not going to be comfortable with uploading some of that data as it could be strategic. Does ESG tree provide some kind of blockchain based systems over which reports can be generated safely? So the first many of the platforms that specifically deal, including ESG tree uh, with large financial institutions, we actually have to go through certifications regarding data security. So ESG tree is SOC 2 aligned, uh, which is the gold standard. So we're aligned with the SOC 2 requirements. And in addition to that, what we find is that our clients are large financial institutions with either lending portfolios or equity portfolios. So once we have gone through this rigorous uh, KYC assessment, then once the client is actually giving us access to their portfolio, there is a high level of trust with the underlying portfolio companies. So for example, if in the case of a private equity firm, they're introducing us to the portfolio companies, uh, their team is involved in those introductions, and they're actually building that encouragement, assigning sustainability champions, and our team is involved with them as well. Uh, that uh, high trust uh, relationship is definitely there. And then because of the high degrees of data security protocols that are uh, available in the system, organizations can securely add their data into the system and also create exports as well. And we have another question. What role can technology such as AI and blockchain play in streamlining the sustainability reporting process under ISSB standards for private companies? Are there any emerging tools or platforms that are gaining traction? So we can address this at a, at a general level because when it comes to sustainability reporting and data gathering accordingly, it is very important to first ensure data validation because a lot of times when this data is being gathered, there may be, we've even seen cases where a portfolio entity, uh, someone in the company has added data. It was a number for revenue and they added one extra zero. So now as a result, when we uh, apply benchmarks or when we normalize their carbon emissions uh, figures relative to the revenue, that is definitely going to show up. So the focus has to be first on ensuring the right data coverage and the data validation. And once the data comes in, then it is very important to provide value to the portfolio companies as well. So the best advice or recommendation that we would be able to provide is to first look at three things when evaluating platforms. The first is the support that you might be able to get for the portfolio entities because there is a lot of handholding needed just to get the data in place, just to create that awareness. And then secondly, we have to 
work quite a bit on making sure that the data actually is relevant and uh, we don't have any gaps in the data. So that validation is also important. So AI can play a role in that. However, it requires a large uh, set of data to be able to train those models right now as well. As this is a nascent field right now, uh, we would highly recommend to first create your own repository for the sustainability data and those challenges to come up and then AI or other technologies can actually be applied based on those very specific challenges. I hope that answers the question. So seeing that we're on the 45 minute mark, if there are any additional questions, please feel free to email us at info at esgtree.com. Uh, we really appreciate all of the participation. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, Daniel, uh, and the CSPM team. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you, goodbye. Okay.